Okay, our first speaker today will be on chronic wasting disease. Uh, a friend of mine that actually runs Adam Acres, uh, actually in right outside of Tuscaloosa, uh, was talking about that the other day. He's speaking in my class. I teach a class, a couple classes at the university at Alabama since I retired from extension. And I teach a wildlife class. And one of the things we were talking about was chronic wasting disease. It's getting bigger and bigger. And we're going to find out a little bit more about that. But today, we have Keith Gordon. Uh, he is the chief of wildlife section of the Alabama Division of Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries. Uh, he's going to talk about the potential, the potential impact on landowners and the economy uh, of the chronic wasting disease. And this is something that uh, is relatively somewhat new, but yet it's getting it's getting worse and worse. But Keith graduated from Auburn University in 1992, and he had a BS in wildlife biology and worked across several states with different state and federal agencies. He eventually came back home to Alabama with the Division of Wildlife and Freshwater Fishing as a wildlife biologist. And he had been with the game and fish now for 12 years. <laughs> he began his first leg of career in the Mobile Tensile Delta and moved up to Montgomery in 2012 as the Assistant Chief of Wildlife Operations and then to the Chief of Wildlife in 2015. So we got the top wildlife top dog up here with us. So Keith Gordon, please come ahead and tell us all about chronic wasting disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our director Chuck Sykes was supposed to come up here and uh, he couldn't make it so he asked me to, to fill in for him. Uh, we'll start off right now saying that we do not have chronic waste disease in the state of Alabama. We've been testing since 2002 and we have not had it yet have a positive detection. But I'll start off and uh, basically tell you guys a little bit about chronic waste disease, what it is, uh, what it looks like as far as clinical signs, where it's at, what type of potential impacts that we could have from it and uh, what we're doing and what you can do all, what you, you all can do to help us keep this deadly disease out of our state. So chronic waste disease, commonly called CWD, lies in a family of diseases called the TSEs. And those, those are the transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. Within that disease family, some of the other diseases are mad cow disease, which is found in cattle, of course, uh, scrapie, which is found in sheep, and also Crisfield's Jacobs disease, which is found in humans. I'm not a, I'm a wildlife biologist by trade, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I read about this stuff for about the past two or three years because of the concern about it coming our way. And it's, a, it's caused by a prion, which is a collection of protein material. It negatively impacts these proteins, the protein material where those proteins misfold, where it prohibits them from doing their job as designed. So proteins, they fold in a certain manner to do a certain function. When they become a prion protein, they misfold, and it's a cascading effect that affects other proteins, and those other proteins misfold as well. It's just a neurological degenerative disease. It affects mainly the members of the family of Cervidae. Oh my good. Okay. I need to turn that off. <laughs> and in uh, the United States, that would be moose, elk, mule deer, and our white-tailed deer. It's contagious, and it's always fatal in these deer. Actually, can occur from animal to animal contact through basically every fluid that's expressed out in the animal that would include mucus, saliva, blood, uh, soft material from their antlers, uh, feces, and semen. And once those materials hit the environment, that environment has been infected, which can the disease can be contracted from that environment. Yes, sir. Has that been uh, migrated to any of the other other wildlife species, turkey or uh, bobcats or any of that stuff? Not. I'll cover some of that. Okay. And at the present time, there's no known vaccine or cure for this disease. Uh, some of the clinical signs, symptoms, basically if a deer is acting like a deer shouldn't act, or if a deer is doing things that a deer should not do, it could have chronic waste disease. Those include emaciation, abnormal behavior, poor coordination, excessive drooling, drinking, and urination, all combined together at the same time. Uh, decreased wariness and a drooping posture. The tapered uh, grain of salt with that because a lot of the diseases that deer commonly have in the state of Alabama can also exhibit these same clinical signs. Can, can I ask you something? Sure you can. They look like the cattle that have BSE. How closely related are these CDD and BSE? It's, it's a TSE as well. 
Yes. Can I cross? Oh. Not this time. It has not been shown that CWD can cross over the cow. There's a pretty strong species barrier there, but I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> if you can, won't you close it till the end? <laughs> but the two primary sources of infection are from the direct animal animal contact through direct exposure, from the transmission of those, those fluids from one deer to another. Uh, also through the infected environment, which I talked of earlier, so any of those bodily fluids that are expressed out into the environment from an infected deer also contaminates that environment. And at this time, there's no, no method to thoroughly mitigate an area that's been infected by chronic waste disease prions, so we need to do all we can do to keep this deadly disease out of our state. Uh, just to show you what happens over time, this is a case study in Iowa. See, over time, the longer this stuff's in the environment, these deer continually express all these bodily fluids, and they ex exchange it from deer to deer, so you have a higher pair once the longer you have it. Also, that blue line represents the male portion of the species, so majority of the male population, in most cases, it has more of a higher prevalence to have chronic waste disease than the female portion of the population. When you think about when white-tailed deer going to rut, some of those bucks will increase their home range four to five times in size. So you can think about the spread of this disease it can also be you know, explained by those bucks moving around as well. So to date, there have been no reported cases of CWD infection in humans. Uh, current research indicates a strong species barrier that prevents this from morphing to a different morph that goes and infects a different type of species. Uh, there has been one limited study in Canada that, that macaque monkeys were, in, that were, they were fed CWD intaken meat and also injected in their brain, and some of those macaques actually did contract CWD. But that's in a really tightly controlled environment in the laboratory setting, not in the wild. In the wild, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, it's, with those cases, the CDC has expressed some concern, and we need to be you know, fairly concerned about that, so they expressed a statement saying that hunters that hunt in areas where chronic waste disease is prevalent, that they highly recommend hunters have those deer tested before consuming the meat from those deer, if those deer are harvested from an area where C CWD has a high prevalence. What's the process for testing? I'll get to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm here. I promise I just about I'm your question. lead man. <laughs> I'll stay after lunch to answer questions too. Okay. Take a lot of your time out. <laughs> so some of the other diseases, our Alabama deer have a lot of different diseases. These are wild animals that are out in the wild. They don't get vaccinated. They don't get any kind of you know, medicines for anything. So they're going to have a lot of things that make them get sick. One of the things that we see commonly that express some of these symptoms are brain abscesses. So you have the deer, they go into rut, they get aggressive with each other, they start hitting their antlers pretty hard. And at times they can hit it so hard where they crack the sutures in their brain brain case. Opens it up to air, they get infected, and anytime you get infection in your brain, it's not good. So these deer will get calls from individuals out in the, in the public. The deer will be standing in the field, they can walk right up to it, sometimes they'll be walking in a circle, or they just find it dead. And a lot of times, our bodies will go up there and respond to it, and they'll have a, a crack right next to the pedestal of their, uh, their antler. I won't say it's real common, but it's not uncommon to see this. Now, this is real common. This is called EHD typically. We have two different uh, strains of HD in Alabama, epizootic hernia disease, and also blue tongue virus, which are basically symptomatic wise, they're both the same thing. People confuse EHD with CWD because it's a three letter acronym. Very, 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 very different. Very different. So EHD is common in Alabama, CWD is not here. Um, some of the, the traits that EHD deer have, they'll get sick. Late summer, early fall, it's caused by biting midge, it's a virus. So if midge bites this deer, bites this deer, bites this deer, they're all infected with HD or EHD or blue tongue. Usually they'll seek some type of water source, either stream or river or pond, and sometimes they actually die and they'll be actually in that body of water. But typically when we have a frost come along and it disrupts the life cycle, that biting midge kills it and then you're through for the year. But a lot of our deer, they get sick with this virus, they overcome it by developing antibodies, so they get over it. 
when they pass those antibodies up and down, the next year it's not as bad when they when they contract it. Uh, the slipping hoof, what it's called in this, sometimes not to that degree, but typically when a deer has HD or blue tongue, they'll have this uh, characteristic saying that they've gotten HD and they've gotten through it. So uh, they have antibodies built up. Sometimes they'll have a, their tongue distended like that. They can't withdraw their tongue back in. In northern states, Tennessee north, where we do have huge dogs of deer because of EHD, typically have colder environments. Those deer don't have the antibodies built up like our southern deer. So you will have that. Once again, EHD is not the same thing as CWD. Some of the other elements, uh, anybody ever seen this before in their deer? Cutaneous fibromas, it's big black warts. Basically, it's just on the exterior part of the skin of these deer. The only way it would harm the deer if it would impede it from seeing or eating. Basically, it's not a good thing to look at. Anybody seen a deer like this before? Usually it's in South Alabama when we see this. It's caused, it's caused by a bacterial infection called the bull eagle syndrome, as you can see. Their nose just looks like a moose nose. It's real large. We also see mange in our deer every now and then. And then because of those, you know, being a wild animal, they get a whole host of parasitic worms, arterial worms. You ever seen a deer has a real big lump in its jaw? That's caused by arterial worms. Uh, nasal bot flies, they're real common. They get those in their sinus capacities. Uh, vehicle impacts, we get a lot of calls off deer acting oddly, and it turns out the deer was hit by a car. So sometimes you will get hit, it doesn't kill them, but it messes them up to agree that they, they act as normal. <coughs> CWD occurrence expansion. It started right here at a captive facility in Fort Collins, Colorado with mule deer. Since that time, it morphed out to wild populations in Colorado and Wyoming, and also to a game farm in Saskatchewan. 2008, you can see a pretty significant spread. Canada, Western States, Southwest, and over this way. To current day, we have chronic wasting disease now in 25 states, two, two Canadian provinces, South Korea, Norway, and Finland. And this is the most important one that sort of got our attention this past year. Uh, I was actually in a deer stand uh, hunting myself when I got a text from the Mississippi chief saying, you need to call me now. What's it doing? phone call on the stand and he told me about their situation over there which is really odd. They, they collected over 400 deer within their chronic waste and disease management zone and have yet to have another positive. It's great news. It's sort of odd the way it's happening but it's uh, really great news. The chronic waste and disease Arkansas distribution, they started off in the core area in the north central part of uh, Arkansas and had a lot of occurrences through here through the years and then started getting these outliers like this. And it could be those bucks increasing their home ranges during that rut period or it can be, which is probably more likely, people taking harvested deer from this area, transporting them, not, you know, they're, they're harvesting the deer and then bringing all the whole carcass or bones with the, uh, with the animal. And, uh, Contaminating the environment thus contaminating deer. It's the Queen of County, Mississippi. Just to show you where it's at, it's the Queen of County is right here along the Mississippi River. This is where their positive detection was. Pretty as far away from us as you can get, so that's good for right now. Potential impacts of chronic waste and disease in the state of Alabama. Some, take, some states have seen it, some states have not, and that's a reduced amount of hunting license sales in the state. For those of you that aren't familiar with how we're funded as an agency, our law enforcement section, they're funded totally off the sales generated off of hunting licenses. For the wildlife section, we operate off federal grants from the Fish and Wildlife Service that's administered under the Pittman Robertson Act, if you haven't heard of that before. We're able to match the sale of hunting licenses those proceeds through our federal grants through the Pippin Robertson Act on a one to four ratio. Say if we have a we have grants for technical assistance to assist private landowners in their management of property, we have grants to fund hunter education, we have grants to fund our non-game section, our wildlife management areas, and we spend four dollars on one of those grants, 
we submit reimbursement to the federal government and they give us three dollars back. So you can imagine what type of economic impact could have us if we have a severe reduction in our hunting license sales. And also the law enforcement efforts you see the number of game wardens that come out and enforce our our wildlife and fisheries, freshwater fisheries regulations. Also, economic impacts. In the state of Alabama, deer hunting is estimated to produce over one billion dollars in economic generation for the state of Alabama. That's a B, not a M. That's big money. So you think about land leases, land values, think about the number of hunters that come to these rural areas. These rural areas really depend on deer hunters in, uh, in the winter. They just buy gas, they buy food, they rent lodging, rent motels. So it's, it's vital that we keep that economic engine turning. Uh, they haven't really, you know, this past, it happened at the end of hunting season this past year in Mississippi, so they really haven't seen what type of impacts it could have on land leases. There were a lot of processors in southwest Mississippi that had a lot of their deer meat left on their shelves that people just didn't come pick up. So, you know, the processors, they were not happy about that at all. And also the cultural shift. You know, I'm a deer hunter myself, and I eat a lot of deer meat. And just the whole thing about having to get deer meat tested, you know, that's something we definitely don't want to have come to the state of Alabama. So what have we been doing through the years to uh, look after this, this danger? Our biologists, we've been uh, sampling the deer herd in Alabama since 2002. We'll take the deer heads. Who was that that asked about how we sample them? See? We get the deer heads from uh, different locations. We cheat the GPS to see what the location is. Record all that data. We take the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are in the back of the throat. We also collect the obex, which is the base of the spine where it meets the brain. And both of those items are basically depositories of prions, prion material. And we submit those to testing with the Alabama Department of Agriculture and Industries. And they uh, have historically sent them off to other labs for the IHC test, the immunohistochemistry test. Uh, recently, the Ag Department, they've obtained the ELISA machine. So we'll be able to do the enzyme link immunosorbent assay in-house. So it'll vastly increase the speed in which we'll have results on our uh, test submissions. These guys do a great job. That's not a, a wonderful chore at 2 in the morning when, you, when you're working up samples like this, but uh, they're doing a great job at that. So if you haven't caught it so far, prevention by far is the best strategy that we can do to mitigate this disease. Uh, like I said, we've been surveilling since 2002, usually collecting about 500 animals a year for testing. Uh, we take them off of hunter harvested deer. We work with processors, taxidermists. We pick up a lot of road kills. We also pick up a lot of target deer. Target deer being defined as deer that the public call in that are acting in some sort of way where they have a clinical sign. Basically acting, acting like a deer should not act. Uh, since 1973, we've had a moratorium on the importation of live services into the state of Alabama. Uh, that would be a really good route for us to get CWD in the state is from the illegal importation. We had a case last month that was uh, finally finalized in which an individual had imported illegally, uh, I think it was four deer from Indiana, which he was caught by our law enforcement section. Those deer were sent back to Indiana, but he was convicted and had to pay some significant fines. It was up in Sumter County. Uh, we also revised our uh, survey carcass importation restriction in 2016, and that prohibits any animal that is harvested a servant harvested out of the state of Alabama cannot be imported into the state of Alabama unless it's been completely deboned. You can have the skull cap with the attached antlers as long as the skull cap is completely cleaned of all the brain matter, all the spinal cord material, and bring back the raw cape if it's cleaned of all the spinal cord material and brain. You can bring back the eye teeth if it's an elk, if it's cleaned of all the soft tissue, and also finish taxidermy products. And that's from chronic waste disease positive states. Uh, we're strongly considering on passing a regulation, modifying this existing regulation to include all states because, you know, Mississippi, we don't know how long they're positive. That's, you know, we, this is a disease we can't risk. We need to take every action we can to try to prohibit the stuff from getting in our state. And also, like I said earlier, we've been doing a lot of 
of surveillance. And it's not just during hunting season we're collecting these deer and doing surveillance. Before you move off of testing, yes, sir. questions. How much, to, how much does it cost to test? And number two, how many did you do in 2016? Oh, um, F, rest estimate. I think 2016, I think we did about 390 something, I think. I think it was that. Uh, we have an active deer breeder program in our state as well, and they submit testing of any deer that dies within their facility as well. Mm -hmm. this, what is a servant? I can't hear you. What is a servant? A servant, that's all your deer species, moose, elk, mule deer, and deer, white-tailed deer, reindeer. Um, and what was the appro approximate cost per test? Oh, around 20 bucks. That's how much. 20 bucks. Okay. And we're working with uh, Ag and Industries, uh, that's the Alabama Diagnostic Labs, mm -hmm. working with them to try to per basically generate a program that the public will be able to submit samples. And we have diagnostic labs, I think we have four throughout the state, so you'll be able to submit a, a sample there for testing and not going through us as the middleman, you'll be able to direct with them and they'll have the license tested, so it's probably about a Within a week turnaround, they'll have probably, they probably kill me for saying something like that. <laughs> but uh, and it'll be around that probably two weeks max, I would say. But I just pulled this off of uh, Facebook the other day from USGS. It's a map that they created. Home zip codes of hunters harvesting deer in Dane, Iowa, Richard, and Salt counties in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, they popped hot in 2002. That's what initiated our surveillance program. So you think about CWD positive material. This is not dots indicating chronic wasting disease. This is just the dots of the zip codes that hunters that hunted in Wisconsin and those counties. But it's uh, alarming and really uh, eye-opening to see the number of folks that hunt in three counties in Wisconsin, CWD positive state. So just think if they're toting, you know, leg quarters with bones in, you know, a full skull, as people just cut off the head of the deer to get them out of brain attached, yes. So that's uh, what we want to do. So if you have friends that hunt out of state and they're, you know, want to bring back those items, by all means, you know, make sure that you tell them about this regulation that's illegal to import those items. So our responses, in 2012, we generated our response plan uh, due to late science in Mississippi. We thought it was wise to go ahead and revise that plan. I'll be releasing that here in the next couple of months, but it's taking in the latest science, a lot of learned lessons from other states that have had chronic wasting disease and how to deal, how to deal with that. Uh, basically it determines the presence, uh, establishes a core area around the CWD positive index animal, and it defines all of our management strategies and actions of what we'll do. So how can, what can you guys do to help out? Do you see any kind of deer exhibiting any of those clinical signs? Acting like it shouldn't, by all means, let us know. If you have a, a deer that you harvest on your land and you want, want to test it, we, you know, we try to do a lot of that each year on our own. We'll have that number for Ag Industries before hunting season next year. For you guys can call that and get your deer tested. Uh, if you see a uh, deer on the back of a truck coming into the state of Alabama from out of state, by all means, let us know from 8 to 5. Monday through Friday, you can call on our district offices. We also have a 1-800-GAME-WATCH number, 1-800-272-4263 that you can call. That's a 24-7 number, and they'll get direct contact with the game warden from the dispatch to uh, respond to those. And for those of you that are computer savvy, dcnr.sickdeerreport at dcnr.alabama.gov. I don't know why they made it so long, but they did. But uh, that's all I have. I thought we'd have uh, plenty of time to ask questions. Let's give Keith a hand. We're going to have to. Oh,